Hi, I'm Catherine Stewart, Principal at Economist Impact, and I'm at Sustainability Week with Joachim Reiter, Chief External and Corporate Affairs Officer, and Luka Mucic, Chief Financial Officer, both from Vodafone Group. Today, we are going to be discussing how sustainability efforts have forced senior business leaders to rethink their roles and responsibilities and how they interact with their peers. Luca, let's start with you. So within your role, how do you interact with sustainability issues and efforts to drive sustainability at Photophone Group? Is sustainability usually top of mind for you? What interactions with teams focused on sustainability uh, do you normally have and what do those look like? Yeah, thanks a lot, Catherine, and thanks for having us. So first of all, I should start with the fact that I've only joined Vodafone recently, about half a year ago, um, but I came from a company, um, SAP, where I was responsible for sustainability strategy operations and reporting, uh, which was very focused on sustainability. I'm also serving on the board of Heidelberg Materials, uh, um, a building materials company that is also uh, seeing sustainability as uh, part of its license to operate. Uh, so I've always been very passionate uh, about the topic Topic. And what I can say I'm, I've been extremely glad to witness is uh, that as I arrived here, uh, the purpose of the company to really um, help connecting for a better future uh, is resonating all across the board. And it's really something that people are taking on board. There's a simple reason for that, I would say, and that is that um, the core essence of our business uh, is really about fostering uh, digital um, inclusion, uh, fostering um, social cohesion, for example, through our fintech services in Africa, um, the connectivity services in IoT that Vodafone provides is helping driving circularity. So there is actually truth to the statement in uh, what we do on a daily basis. And that, of course, makes it uh, easier as well uh, to connect uh, across uh, a, a number of stakeholders and bring the topic of sustainability to life. Uh, soon after I landed here, uh, I was very happy to know that my financial reporting team had actually already started preparing uh, for an early adoption of the CSR directive uh, in Europe uh, that uh, as a non-EU filer, we would not have necessarily uh, needed to adopt at this early point in time, um, but they were leaning in already and preparing for that. Uh, in my treasury team, um, our um, 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 RCF, our revolving credit facility, is act actually having an ESG criterion to it that can drive the interest rates uh, to a more attractive level if we succeed um, on that uh, in my FP&A group, um, the work to embed uh, the investments that are needed uh, to drive for a successful sustainability agenda are now built into our mid and long range financial planning. So lots of activities have been going on in the company already before I landed. And I, of course, uh, used the opportunity to dive uh, into it right away. Um, but equally importantly, the partnership with Joachim uh, and his team uh, around uh, marrying up the sustainability strategy and operations that he's owning uh, with uh, actually accuracy um, and completeness in our reporting of the same has been really very refreshing. Um, and ex it extends obviously beyond our two functions uh, because we need to have the core business functions like network operations on our side and uh, to really drive towards success. So it's a manifold uh, network uh, of contacts that you need to establish to bring sustainability to life. I'm very happy um, that uh, this is exactly what I could witness here at Vodafone. I do want to dig in a little bit about how this differs from some of your other day-to-day -day commitments, although it sounds like they're they're tied. But first, I want to come to you, Joachim, and talk through you obviously look at this from the external perspective as opposed to the internal perspective. So how do you see your roles and responsibilities around sustainability and how are they similar to the rest of your roles and responsibilities and how do they differ? Uh, so, so first, you utilized a word when you addressed both of us, which was forced. And I think Luca highlighted very well that actually when it comes to the broader ESG agenda and sustainability and, and ultimately our purpose, it hasn't been forced onto the organization. It's something that is, is deeply embedded in our culture. Our, our purpose commitment and the way that we service society is something that when I joined Vodafone seven years ago, there was no one putting that in question. I mean, this was part and parcel of our DNA. What the ESG agenda, if you say forced by governments, imply is that we have had to bring more rigor to it, a structure to it, so as to respond to, say, reporting requirements 
or the type of regulation that is now coming from government. But it, it didn't arrive in a vacuum as a company. The DNA of the company is very, very uh, hardwired around doing good for society. And therefore, it has been quite easy to not draw a distinction between what we're doing externally and internally, actually coming together very, very well. So I don't, I don't feel that there is a, a, there is a, um, a, an, a difficulty of embedding what are increasing external requirements into an organization. It is involving, of course, a lot of hard work. And, and one of the things that we had to do across this journey was to move from uh, sort of letting all flowers blossom, uh, being very, very, um, uh, having staff that are very, very committed to this to actually create a structure behind it. So as to not least to get Luca being able to report non-financial numbers in the same, with the same rigor as we report financial numbers. Now that's a journey. But it is a journey whereby the type of activities we did already as a company prior to the establishment of new regulations and requirements by regulations was already well embedded and well functioning in, within the company. So I, I found that in my role, it's, yes, it's external, but a lot of it was to actually marry the external expectations with what was already an incredible rich agenda internally and to make sure that those two activities gel between themselves. So it's, it's as opposed to sort of transmitting from one direction to the other direction, it is more how do you marry those two agendas. Is that usual in terms of the, the role that you play? Are most of your roles and uh, most of your responsibilities wedding what's happening internally with what's happening externally? Or is this unique to sustainability in a lot of ways? No, I think it's the same. I mean, I'm, I'm also in charge of security, for example. And there again, we have, I'm including security operations inside the company when it comes to corporate security, physical security, investigation, stuff like that. And I marry that with this increased focus by governments on national security requirements, uh, including, for example, uh, around stress tests of cable networks or how do you deploy network uh, in, in general. It doesn't mean that I'm responsible for the security of networks. We have a CTO that is more than capable of doing it. But <laughs> what I do is I partner with him so that what he's doing or what the, that function is aspiring to achieve is gelling with also the erased requirements coming from the external environment. So, so I don't think that, that that understanding of external affairs of being sort of a entirely externally focused is true. I think, and for sure in Vodafone, it's one where you are becoming a partner with the business, different functions, finance being a very essential one, but same thing for technology, many times HR when it comes, for example, to our governance, cyber when it comes to our, uh, the G under ESG, and, and to make sure that those um, internal activities are in line with and, um, and support also what are the uh, increasing demands that comes from the external environment? And that, that the understanding of also the external environment for what we intend to do and what we seek to do is fully, is fully um, uh, landing well. So my job is to represent the company, but, it, but it's also to represent the external environment and find that sweet spot where there is an alignment in ambition between what is expected externally with what already is being done internally. Look up for you coming into this organization not that long ago and having a set of new reporting requirements, um, expectations externally. To what extent does your interaction with sustainability and your your focus on sustainability look different from some of the other jobs that you do day to day? Do you see any changes in the way you interact on this specific issue? Um than you do on other types of issues that are your day-to-day -day roles and responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel very similar to, to Joachim on this? No, I think first of all, uh, uh, obviously, um, you sometimes believe that uh, CFOs are primarily inside focused and are dealing with internal stakeholders that obviously couldn't be more distant from uh, uh, the reality um, and has been for a while. Uh, um, in my role, I uh, interact with customers quite frequently. We have a strong growing B2B enterprise business uh, that already represents 30% of our revenues and is growing. Um, and uh, so I meet a lot of our enterprise customers, suppliers, and partners as well, and then obviously investors. Uh, and uh, while um, I would say the depth uh, and uh, the quantum of those uh, interactions has not really changed dramatically as a result of the advent uh, of uh, 
of uh, ESG. Uh, media would be another stakeholder group that obviously uh, is, uh, uh, is also to be named here. Um, I think what changes over time um, is clearly um, that uh, ESG is taking more as of a center stage as part of those uh, um, discussions. Uh, and you think about customers, uh, all of them also have to fulfill um, their indirect emissions uh, targets, scope two and scope three. So for them, understanding how Vodafone as a partner and supplier um, is actually addressing uh, its own uh, carbon footprint uh, to drive down um, the impact that they will have to take on board in their own uh, reporting is becoming more important and so you see it obviously as a qualification or disqualification criterion in more and more um, RFPs. Um, on the investor front, I would say it differs a bit by money center, honestly speaking. If you fly up to Stockholm or to Copenhagen to have an investor roadshow, um, their sustainability is absolutely a top uh, um, um, issue on the agenda. Um, when you go to the US, uh, there's really a big divide between the West Coast and the East Coast. So if, go, if you go to New York, and then you're more likely than not uh, to primarily meet with hedge funds that have different priorities for their interactions with you. But when you go to LA and meet some of the long only guys uh, over there, uh, it's very similar to what you see in large parts of Europe over there. Um, and so um, it's no wonder that this is the case because all of these stakeholders are also facing a situation where the bar um, is raising um, for good reasons. Um, think about the financial industry, for example. Um, they clearly have, due to the advent of the EU taxonomy and the requirements for sustainable financing, uh, a big um, um, challenge um, to bring up um, their share of uh, you know, environmentally su uh, sustainable or socially sustainable investments as a share of their total investment portfolios. And therefore, um, the the need for more qualified uh, disclosures, also for more stringent assurance around those disclosures is clearly uh, increasing. Um, as a result of this, uh, more and more ESG criteria also find their way into the incentive schemes, uh, not only of companies at large, but of course also the board. Uh, uh, Vodafone is no exception in that respect. And that, of course, drives up also the challenge uh, from uh, a level of assurance perspective. As of today, uh, most frameworks still demand limited assurance uh, for the financial reporting of non-financial information. However, that will not end there. Uh, the more it becomes part of compensation, the more reasonable assurance will become the standard. And that means you just simply have to um, get better quality data uh, in place uh, and uh, you know focus on the entire uh, process chain. And those are the types of conversations uh, that uh, I'm having uh, quite a lot, but they're the right ones because at the end of the day, trust-based information is really uh, what uh, will be extremely uh, important um, to segregate companies with the right and trustworthy focus on sustainability on others that perhaps rather uh, drive lip service to the topic. Joachim, I want to ask you, um, and this goes back to what both of you said at the beginning of this conversation around how you define sustainability within Vodafone. Because mm. often when I have these conversations, I hear a lot about environmental sustainability, but what interested me is both of you went into the social facet yeah. of sustainability first. So talk to me a little bit about how you see that definition and how that plays out within the organization. Yeah, and by the way, not to forget governance. I think I think if you look at Luca stakeholder, um, uh, less so mine, by the way, uh, but for sure Luca stakeholder. If you look at investors and and indices, they rank uh, governance very very high, and in particularly in a, in a sector which is critical national infrastructure, our ability to protect data, so privacy and cyber, are something that logically investors are very very keen on the, us having both the capabilities and the reporting to give them confidence that we have the right uh, processes in place uh, because it's sort of essential for our license to exist as a company, uh, which links to broader resilience questions, business continuity as, as well. So, so you will have had a lot of focus in that space within the telecom industry and for the telecom industry for a long time. And that's really nothing new, even though, as Lucas said, the bar is continuously being raised, in, not least by governments. The second, the second pillar that everyone talks about is environment. And I, I think you know, I've been on this journey a little bit longer than Luca. I mean, I joined Vodafone seven years ago, and I felt when I joined Vodafone, the social pillar was incredibly strong in Vodafone. 
actually with the environmental pillar that wasn't very strong and we didn't really see our right to play to that extent. But as Lucas said, there is some, some very significant changes that are happening. The fact that, you know, as we are becoming an incredibly important supplier and the way that we allow other companies to reduce their carbon footprint by the way that they procure our services or by the way that we deliver our services and how we take environment uh, seriously has allowed us to very much leapfrog on that agenda over the, particularly the last three years. I would say that you know we moved to a situation where we're now aspiring to be a leading telco when it comes to the environmental pillar and I think we've done quite well, as has been shown by the latest CDP ranking, for example. And and that that has been that resonates very well with what also governments have been pursued. But the the uniqueness of Vodafone, I would say, when I've joined and it's still today, is the manner in which we address the social pillar. And it's true from an external environment that's often less well defined, and there's less discussion around it. If I compare with the other pillars, but in the case of telecoms, I mean, you start with something as basic as you know we. Ultimately, when you roll out uh, it, the modern infrastructure network that we do, the GDP impact, the, the you basically disperse the nodes of growth, the ability of people to devise or construct a different future for themselves, the different types of jobs, the access to the education, the access to healthcare that they get by having connectivity is incredibly powerful for the improvement of society. And, and, and we in Europe has often forgotten about this. If you, you know, I'm sitting on the board of Vodacom, for example, and, and work very heavily with the African market, no one in the right mind there questions the social impact of telecommunications. In Europe, it's less of a prevalent discussion, yet to Luca's point, it is still very much the case. And, and during COVID, in my view, that actually became uh, something that everyone recognized at the point where, you know, Nightingale uh, pop-up hospital to deal with COVID patients came. We were there to connect it, to make sure that there were uh, the ability of those patients to call their loved ones before they were put into intensive care units. And, you know, all of those small things, the fact that kids were able to access education from home by not only having connectivity, but also the, the impro improving device affordability, making sure that they have their tablets or the laptop so as to connect the manner in which NHS has leapfrogged on digitization, thereby providing through uh, t telematic um, uh, uh, services, being basically able to or, uh, uh, provide digital uh, um, um, meetings with the surgeries and, and, and co contact between doctor and patient. Or for that matter, post when you deal with post-COVID, how you monitor your health through digital devices is fundamentally revolutionizing healthcare. So on item after, after item, I think we are bringing back the mojo of the social pillar of telecoms in Europe. And I think that's a really, really, really important thing that we as societies actually dare to talk about because that's a lot where the magic lies. And in Europe, I think we lost the debate for the last sort of, uh, when, you know, like over the last 10 years and it has resurfaced with COVID. I, I just hope that people don't forget the learnings we had from COVID and still lean into this agenda. But from a government point of view, in terms of regulation, in my view, this is the area probably where it has been less well-defined. It's been very focused in Europe on whether basic, basic affordability, in other words, whether you have driven down the price point, whether there's been enough price deflation, the cost of living crisis is a very real one and, and legitimate debate in Europe and, and including in the UK. I think, for example, the digital device that we still see in our society between rural and urban, the fact that people have to leave a rural countryside to seek big cities and therefore putting enormous pressure on urbanization, therefore driving air pollution, congestion and other things, how we are utilize connectivity to make sure that small and medium sized companies or women can stay in the countryside if they so choose and still have uh, fantastic careers and, and access uh, the best jobs that are available is a very, very important social project. You know, in the UK it's called leveling up. That's basically what it's about. I would also add so, men being able to stay, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna think about the way, kind of, even on baseline farming, if you're gonna make that a viable business for people agree. moving forward, yeah. Yeah, and if you think about the sort of the farmers' death in Europe and the UK, the number of farms that are being closed, and yet we're debating how to ensure food security. I mean, there's a contradiction here that we as a society needs to resolve, and we we are not the whole solution, but we can partner with governments in devising a package together between public and private, by which we give more optionality and more uh, opportunities for these type of uh, stressed sectors to basically have a second life. And I think that's something where we play a very, very important social role. It's, I'm very passionate about this. Uh, but, Me too. But I, I'm glad we yeah, had this conversation. It's, yeah, very, it's but, very interesting. 
Yeah, and it's 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 it, what I find is sometimes frustrating as an external affairs director or a person that works with government is, you know, um, this is a this is an enormous untapped potential for closer collaboration between government and corporate sector. The reality, government by itself struggles to meet the needs in terms of closing all the digital devices. It needs to leverage the the power and the know-how of corporates, and we are very very happy to help doing that. And you know, in the past, we talked about our role as in form of a social contract. And that's basically to ensure that we get that partnership close, close to digital device, be it for, as you say, rural, urban, be it women, men, women, men be it around uh, SMEs versus large corporate and helping SMEs to digitize faster, thereby improving the productivity of the countries we work in. So there's a lot so that we do I in this you, space. Can I ask you one question on that? You, you spoke about COVID being a uh, moment where the concept of social sustainability really came back onto the agenda. Do you see that as well as a moment where the gap between government and the private sector actually closed a bit because yeah. of the, the necessity? Did that, the, did that make a change in your ability to have these conversations? Yeah, so I mean, basically, uh, there, there are critical junctures, and I spent most of my life in government, so I, I know this quite well. You know, you, you, the path dependency in government is incredibly strong. Uh, why? Because the uh, rural government is actually partly to solve citizens' needs, but also mistakes minimization. That's, not a, that's something where the private sector is much more free to explore and experiment and take risk. Government is usually not constrained in its risk appetite. But when you have a crisis of the magnitude you have with COVID, governments are, if you want, unshackled from that. They have to take risk. They don't know what to do, but they know they need to do something. And that's a, that's a very painful situation for a government to find itself to be in. Now, we as a, so both, on both sides, both us and government, we killed a lot of darlings during COVID. We basically said, let's redefine our roles. Let's work together. We didn't have the, all the answers. They didn't have all the answers. But by coming together, we tried to co-create answers. That actually happened during a, a COVID period. One of the, my, my frustrations or one of the things I advocate a lot is that we should learn from that period. We, we had an opportunity. We actually, all of us, did better because we redefined our roles. Let's continue to do that. Let's continue to have the courage to redefine our roles because some of the gaps in society that were exposed during COVID that are lingering in inequalities in societies. We're not going to be able to resolve them if we fall back to status quo in the way we did things pre-COVID. Let's, let's nurture the magic that happened when all of us actually dared to take more risk and find new ways of collaboration. And if I may I just add, I think we should never forget that all of those three pillars, uh, the economic, the environmental and the social, um, they are all forming a triangle and are closely connected uh, with each other. Because uh, without a balance on economic progress, uh, we will fall behind in having the investment capacity uh, to tackle the environmental challenge. And of course, uh, we will actually create further perils on the social front. Uh, whereas if we don't tackle um, the social um, challenge that we are facing, more and more societies, actually, we might run out of runway uh, in order to um, tackle the rest. So at the end of the day, we really need to have a holistic approach to all of those three pillars. Yeah, and I think, Catherine, if I may, just build on what Lucas said, because it's a really interesting question. It's, you know, in the end, when you talk about the ESG, if I deal with it from an external affairs perspective and dealing with governments, it's in those trade-offs that they, we need to have an open conversation. This, this, you can't have it all. You know, the corporate sector is not Santa Claus and government doesn't have unrestricted sort of budget availability. There are fiscal constraints. Therefore, how we come together and manage those trade-offs and understanding the capabilities we bring, but also the limitations that we have, and for them to be transparent around their prioritization, but also the limitations they find themselves. And, 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 and having honesty around that conversation is super important because as Luca said, all these three objectives interact and therefore how a society, including with this corporate sector, debates maturely about the necessary trade-offs involved unavoidably is very, very important. So Luca, then let's go back to kind of the, the day-to-day and thinking about the cost of investing in sustainability efforts. Specifically here, we've been talking about um, kind of that new deep dive into the environmental pillar of sustainability and how you can control costs. Because obviously that is at the, the center of what you do. You are in charge of cost control. How do you balance that? What does that look like? What do you recommend to people who are undergoing the same kind of challenges you're going on this front? 
Yeah, um, this is a very important question. Obviously, also, since we're active in an industry here in Europe um, that has been characterized, I would say, by relatively slow growth uh, and certainly a pressure on returns and therefore scarcity um, of capital um, is a clear topic that we have to be um, aware of and have to manage. Uh, I'm actually defining my role uh, less uh, in terms of cost control, but most of all through uh, optimized resource allocation. And that's, I think, ultimately uh, what we need to drive towards. We have, uh, as Joachim has said, uh, finite resources, and we need to put them um, to work uh, where they drive uh, for the biggest impact. So there is clearly a tension, of course, between the investments that we need uh, to drive for um, a sustainable transformation of our business model, uh, um, the environmental front. Uh, um, and uh, on the other hand, of course, there are plenty of other investment needs across the firm. But I think we need to stay aware of, uh, of two uh, important uh, paradigms. One is the opportunity cost of not acting and not investing in sufficient time ahead. Uh, will be much, much higher. You see already today that the pressure uh, that the authorities are um, exerting on things like, for example, um, the cost uh, of the carbon transfer system uh, in Europe, uh, cost of offsets uh, is rising. So uh, if you don't put uh, sufficient investments in place today, you will end up paying way more a couple of years down um, the road. And that obviously, if you make the NPV calculation of your business case and your valuation um, should always be a uh, front and center. And then the second one is to really understand uh, where you, you are putting the investments for which kind of uh, return. And that brings me um, to, I would say, the next frontier um, that companies uh, still need to achieve in terms of uh, their um, performance management, not only in financial, but also non-financial terms. Um, we still come from a situation where we are collecting a lot of input variables. So how much investment uh, do we put in uh, to reduce uh, um, our carbon footprint, whereas we should really move more and more towards uh, what I would call impact valuation. Um, so output related metrics uh, to really be able to track uh, what is the ripple effect that we have been able to achieve across our entire process value chain with certain uh, focused investments to ultimately end up uh, with uh, more than a one-on-one -on -one correlation, so to say, between what you put in and what you get out of that. Um, but I don't want to neglect the challenge that comes along with that. So it was a very big uh, step forward um, that uh, jointly with Joachim and his team, we were actually able to devise a climate transition plan that has now very clear buckets of investment for the next couple of years attached to it that are baked into our internal financial plan and not uh, something that would be an add-on, but actually an intrinsic and embedded element of that. And that will give us predictability in uh, having made those choices uh, in uh, a view to uh, driving for optimized returns from it in achieving our midterm objectives from a carbon perspective. I think you've found the biggest challenge that, that every organization is asking themselves right now, which is how do we measure impact? Um, if you figure out the answer, let us know, because everyone mm -hmm. does want to, to know the answer to that. Um, looking towards kind of the end of the session, clearly both of you and, and Vodafone has made some really big strides around this issue. If you're thinking about giving a couple of tips to organizations who are just embarking on this journey, um, what would you tell them? What would you say they should focus on and why and how? Um, how do you do mm -hmm. this? So, yeah. uh, Lucas, Absolutely. you want to start us off and Yoki yeah. can give us the final world? Yeah, I can do a first pass at that. So I think, first of all, really challenge yourselves on where you make a truly differentiated impact in your core business. Uh, I think it's very important uh, to uh, closely embed uh, sustainability uh, with the essence of what makes you strong as a company and when you can differentiate, um, like, for example, in the case of Vodafone uh, in the Internet of Things uh, or in our fintech offerings, then really rally the troops uh, around that. The second one would be um, really see sustainability not as something uh, that uh, is uh, 
uh, a headquarters topic, but actually drive hard uh, to embed it deeply in the operational responsibilities across the company and then measure it uh, with clear metrics uh, that you can hold the organization accountable um, to it. Um, that I think uh, would be my um, top three uh, recommendations. And I've seen them work actually in the other organizations that I've been uh, associated with uh, uh, at Heidelberg Materials, for example, everyone across the company is measured against their, uh, them bringing down the carbon impact. And that has a big uh, um, implication on how they allocate investments. So I think only there um, you can really have a true impact if you um, associate it closely with the core of your operations. Joachim? Uh, uh, Luca covered a lot. I think uh, if I can add and uh, maybe just build, um, uh, because I violently agree with everything he said. Um, for me, one of the hardest things we did in Vodafone and one of the things that actually um, that all organizations will struggle with is how do you move from something which was previously very much CSR was sitting on top. It was a icing on the cake. It was a storytelling approach into one which is embedded into your DNA and, and everything you do and ev what everyone is doing every day of the week, which means you need to go back to the, the core values, the core uh, activities that you do. And the, the shift, you know, it, for it to resonate, um, um, the, the, the belief in it is not enough. You actually have to be very clear around your operating model. You need to disperse the accountabilities. If you look, for example, on our ESG agenda, every single EXCO member is in charge of certain targets and have an accountability to, de to develop and ensure the, the reporting that then Lucas' team uh, verifies and ensures the accuracy of. So we have created what I call the ESG factory model, where I'm sort of designing the car and I'm in the end selling the car. Uh, Lucas' team is basically overseeing the assembly line, but, but then within the EXCO and within local markets, every single GMT, every single individual has part of the construction of the car, if you can put it like that, that then leads to end result. And that's super important to make it part of mainstreaming and embedding it into the business where everyone... So I would say operating model be critically clear on it. Races, rapids, super important, uh, which we spend a lot of time to try to get right. And then finally, don't forget the importance of air cover. I think what Vodafone did quite well to get this to fly really within the company was... Luca and his predecessor were very clear around how it's being demanded by investors. I was very clear around how it's being demanded by government so that we understood that that's actually part and parcel of what it means to be a telecom company for the future. And, and, and it had a real material business impact. And then we overlay that with a board. So from board level down to sort of the machine floor, everyone is aligned on what we need to do. And that's, in my view, extremely important. So it doesn't become... Uh, where you have individual champions that are driving what is seen as a pet project, but it becomes truly embedded. And that's hard work. It takes a long time. And I think we're still, frankly, on the journey, but we're trying our best. Thank you both. Um, this has been so, so interesting. So thank you, Luca. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot.